All right, folks, let's talk about the rape of Nanking. Now, the rape of Nanking is going to take place December 13th, 1937 through January of 1938. Now, you can see a number of different pictures on the screen. I'm going to walk through these in clockwise order and just kind of explain what is going on. The first one, uh, we're going to see a bloody um, and bruised Chinese baby sitting in the rubble of a town, simply crying. Uh, again, this is a disturbing picture and hard to look at, um, but this is the reality, and this is why it's being positioned there. The next one, we see a injured Chinese soldier um, <clears throat> right there with the Japanese soldier about to execute him. Um, clearly, he is defenseless. Clearly, he cannot fight back, yet he is about to be killed. Uh, on the bottom one, we see a series of Japanese men, or Chinese men, excuse me, on the ground about to be, be beheaded um, for their crime so to speak, of simply fighting against the Japanese. Um, in reality, they're murdered, being about to be murdered for defending their homeland, which is being invaded during Japanese expansionism. Now, uh, during this time period, there's going to be 50,000 to 300,000 dead. Uh, the accounts of this is going to vary widely. Um, the Japanese did try to cover this event up after the fact, um, which is part of the reason we do not exactly know how many people were truly killed during this event. But the fact of the matter is there were a large number of individuals who were murdered um, simply for being in the city of Nanking. Now, this is going to be a mass murder and mass rape of Chinese citizens, um, which is just traumatic and horrible, and really in whatever way you put it. Again, it's going to be committed by the Japanese soldiers when they go invading. Um, really, no one is safe. And they're not just fighting against combatants. Uh, they're really fighting against anyone who is in the city and anyone who is not Japanese. Uh, the Japanese kind of had this belief that they are the superior race and that anyone who's involved um, against them needs to be killed. Uh, and that's exactly what is going to be happening here in Nanking. Now, as I was talking about already, most of the documents detailing the event were going to be destroyed um, because the Japanese realized that they were doing horrible things and that if the news of this gets out, it's not going to help them on the international scene. Um, not that they really care what other people are going to be doing. They've already kind of gotten away with that. Um, previously, uh, but the fact of the matter is they don't want the evidence around so the people can know exactly what's happening. Um, so they're going to simply destroy a lot of the stuff. The soldiers who were there and took part in this really aren't going to be talking about it. Word will get out eventually after the war because we're talking about it right now. Uh, but the important thing to understand is that this was a massive, massive campaign of just murder and rape. Um, it's really incredibly intense and depressing levels. So that's the Rape of Nanking. Next, we're going to talk about American internment camps. Now, these are going to take place from February 19th, 1942 until March 20th, 1946, and it's going to be a part of Executive Order 9066. Now, Executive Order 9066, signed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, is going to cause the forced relocation of 110 to 120,000 Japanese Americans uh, from the western part of the United States. Now, 60%, 62% of these individuals were American citizens, meaning the laws uh, and the requirements of the United States Constitution do apply to them. They do have certain rights because they are American citizens, um, the same way anyone who had been a white individual in the United States is an American citizen. Uh, this is going to be done to protect the United States from spies. Uh, and that was the rationale behind this. This was going to go to the Supreme Court, which ultimately is going to determine that this was ethical and this was, uh, not ethical, but this was constitutional and this would have been allowed. So remember, after war, uh, the uh, Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese did attack the United States of America. December 8th, 1941, the United States is going to join World War II officially. And at this time, there's going to be a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment going on in the United States of America. Uh, the U.S. does not trust the Japanese at all, and they don't really feel that anyone who is Japanese um, is going to be trustworthy. Uh, it's also important to understand at this time period, or just right before this, there was a large number of Japanese citizens who did move to the United States Okay, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So a lot of these Japanese citizens lived on the west coast of the United States were either first or second generation Americans. So they were either born in Japan or their parents were born in Japan, and a number of them also had their grandparents born in Japan. The belief by a lot of Americans was that they're going to be uh, loyal to their country of their heritage versus the country they are now living in. So in order to protect the United States from these individuals, they need to be locked up in some sort of camp. Now, what's the problem with this? The problem with this is they are American citizens. You cannot just simply put someone in jail, so to speak, or enforce someone to relocate due to um, 
their ethnicity, okay, due to their heritage. Uh, imagine if this happened today, how many people would stand up and hopefully do something against it. Um, so try to put this in a similar perspective. This would be like putting someone away um, simply because of the anse their, their ancestry, okay? We don't like the Irish people. We're going to put them away because we don't trust the Irish. Um, something that you have no control over, even if you're a full-on um, loyal American citizen, you're going to be put in these camps. Another issue that's going to be happening is a lot of these individuals are going to lose everything when they are forcibly relocated. Uh, if you have a family shop that you're running in some, uh, one of these cities, okay, like in Chinatown in San Francisco, uh, when you leave, someone else is going to take that. So you're going to lose your house, you're going to lose your business, and you're going to really have nothing. So it's a number of different issues going on uh, with this. You can see right here, here's two different pictures of these camps. This is uh, These are two pictures from Hart Mountain Internment Camp outside of Cody, Wyoming. Um, these are the barracks that would have been living in. Now, these barracks uh, were a lot nicer than the internment camps that the Nazis, or the concentration camps the Nazis had. So realize Nazi concentration camps and U.S. internment camps are two very, very different things. Um, but these are what they're going to be living in. Okay? So they're going to be these little homes right through here. Uh, not even really homes. Okay? A small little room. Um, the fam one family room would be probably about half the size of my classroom where the entire family would be living. A couple beds in there, a stove to cook on and for heating. Um, everything just like that. They're located very far away from major cities um, in pretty much the wilderness as a way of kind of keeping them from being able to get anywhere um, if they do try to escape. Uh, second one we see is a little boy sitting down there by the fence. Now, they were able in some instances to go into the city for a while. I know at Heart Mountain especially, um, they were able to leave for a while, go into the city of Cody and then come back, or town of Cody, and then come back in at night. Um, however, the fact of the matter is they were forcibly interred because they were Japanese Americans. A um, number of different issues going on with that. So understand what happened here. If you have any questions, comments, put it down below. Otherwise, I'll talk to you later. Good luck.